Welcome everybody. This is a, I almost forgot which podcast this was going to be. This is Internet Marketing Unleashed. I'm the power podcaster, the Dean of Blogonomics and Pedology, Scott Patton. I am in Odessa, Ukraine. I'm really excited to be uh, broadcasting live to you today. And I am incredibly excited because my guest comes from an advertising and design background. He's won many, many awards uh, over the years, including an AAF Addy Award and ARDA Awards. He's worked with a wide range of companies around the globe and has released several award-winning digital training project, products. More recently, he has focused on consulting and mentoring business leaders. And I asked him to join us today because I wanted to talk a little bit more about the entrepreneurial mindset and pivoting your business, but really taking your business to the next level. The analogy that I really loved, and I think many of us get into it, which is uh, treading water in a very comfortable pool. And I know I have, and and I'm sure that you all can, can uh, relate to that as well. So I want you to uh, join me in welcoming my very good friend, Eric Stafford. Hey, Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. It really is wonderful to catch up with you and see uh, what the view looks like in Odessa. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. So uh, before we get started, I was thinking about our, our chat today. And, you know, oftentimes uh, there's, <clears throat> there's all these canned questions and everything else. And there's never anything really interesting or <clears throat> uh, unusual. So I was thinking about that as I was walking back here to, today to, to do this. And I was thinking of my childhood and you know some of the some of the things that happened that were really funny. And one of the things that happened was uh, my parents they were too poor to afford a hotel or a motel when we went on vacation. They never told us that, but they were they had enough money to buy a tent. So we tented across Western Canada, and not knowing any better, we just thought that's what people did. You know, tented. And I later found out my dad hated tenting, but that he uh, he only did it because that was the only way he could get out of the city. Couldn't afford a motel. Uh, but one day when we were uh, picnicking, we were on a picnic table, and my dad was on one side, my sister and I and my mom were on the other side, and he, he needed to get something from the car. So he jumped up, ran to the car, and when he came back, the picnic table had tipped over, <laughs> and there was the three of us laying with all the food on top of us, unable to kind of get out from under this picnic table, and he roared with laughter, and we, of course, were roaring with laughter too because this thing tipped in slow motion as you can imagine and uh, I don't know why that just I haven't thought of that memory in probably decades but it just sort of popped up and so I wanted to start this off by asking you you know what are some or one you know of your and it doesn't have to be you know slapstick but what are what are your favorite memories when you were a child wow man I, I love that story you know the the thing that that story the thing that that story really brings to me in a powerful way, Scott, is, is, you know, when I was growing up, my parents divorced when I was quite young, right? And my father had a upper middle income job, and he really lived quite comfortably. Uh, and my mother really struggled. She didn't uh, have as much money. She didn't have as much stability. Um, you know, she sort of worked different jobs as she had to, to, to make things work. Um, but what is really interesting, what I find is that, you know, when we would travel with my dad, uh, you know, he would he would work his tail off for the entire year so that we could go somewhere for two weeks over Christmas. And we would fly nice airplanes and we would stay in nice Marriott's and we would go all throughout the Caribbean and we would eat burgers and do all this incredible stuff. Right. And when my mom would travel with us, it was sort of like you had explained. Right. It was uh, we weren't staying in hotels with hallways. We were staying in motels with parking lots in front. Right. Um, like the locks on the outside, you better have a gun on the inside type type of place. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but you know what I find interesting when I look back on that now, it's been several years and I, I hadn't thought about it until you told that story is that one wasn't more fun or more enjoyable or more expansive than the other. My memories of traveling with my father with money and doing, you know, yacht trips and fishing trips and charters and going to the Caribbean and this and that are just as strong as my memories with my mom 
of going, you know, beneath the university to where she had found a glass blowing studio and where people would, you know, show us glass blowing for three hours if we if my mom brought them lunch and ten bucks, right? Um, and so, you know, that's a very powerful lesson, and I think it's influenced my life uh, more recently in the last couple of years when I just sort of realized I was working in a business that I didn't enjoy, and it was bringing in plenty of income, but I just wasn't happy, and. Um, and so I think there's there's a good lesson there for the fact that um, money, I guess, really isn't everything, right? And I know that's a little cliche, maybe, but I found that to be very true in my life. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting dilemma because there are many people that make very very good money and have no time, or have such stress that they really can't enjoy it. Or they can enjoy it a little bit, but they have so much stress that they're probably not going to enjoy it for long because of high blood pressure, uh, obesity, or heart attacks coming up. And uh, to be able to find that way of, of living a life that you want, I guess it's, you know, do you, do you live or do you live to work? And when you live to work, you have a real problem because uh, you have no relationships, right? Yeah, it's really tough, right? Like I, I, I know, I, I know personally a lot of entrepreneurs, and I've, I've worked with several now, who, um, from all external purposes, you would look at them and think, "Wow, they have everything that I want." Um, but a lot of these people are, you know, cheating on their on their spouses, or addicted to food, or drugs, or spending, or whatever, and. They're not the spouse they want to be. They're not the man or the woman they want to be. They're not the parent they want to be because they've sort of lost their identity in this pursuit of, of money. Um, and again, I mean, that just kind of touches back on what we were talking about, right? Like, does money buy happiness? Um, you know, what I've learned is that money buys fun toys, but I can also be perfectly happy without those toys. And... Um, you know, it, it took me it took me a lot of work, man, to admit that that was my truth because I'd been, you know, sort of 10xing it and grinding and hustling and doing all those things that everyone says I'm supposed to do for a very, very long time. And to step back and and, and look at my business and realize, wow, I, I hate this. Um, mm. What the hell am I doing this for? Um, you know, it, it just brought about a lot of feelings I don't know that I was ready to to examine, right? Like, I, you know, no one ever taught me that in entrepreneur school, that you would build a business that made a lot of money but made you unhappy. No one, you know, and I look at my social media feeds and they're all filled with abundance and beauty and expensive things and, and you're supposed to be grateful and abundant. And I, I, I didn't, I couldn't separate the fact that I was miserable with gratitude, right? Like I was incredibly grateful, but I was unhappy. And it just, there was a lot of weird emotions around that, you know, and also who do you talk to about that, right? Who do you talk to without admitting or feeling like a failure, right? And so I, I didn't talk to my wife about it. She had two kids running around here that were hungry all the time and dropping things. And so I just didn't really know who to talk to about that stuff or where to take that stuff. And uh, it was a very confusing and frustrating time. As can you imagine, right, Eric, you go up to your wife and you say, Wendy, I want to be a bum on the street. <laughs> right. You know, right. she's, she's going to say, Eric, we have two kids. We have to feed them. They need to go to school. They need braces. Right. Are you crazy? Yeah. <laughs> well, not that she's not understanding and compassionate, right? I mean, to be married to an entrepreneur is a very difficult job. Yes. Uh, but, but, you know, she's uh, pragmatic and she's got her mind on college funds and on groceries and on the things that we need to live in our day to day life. And so to be able to go to her and say, hey, listen, you know, I need to go to a monastery for a month and really rethink this whole thing. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. Right. And so and I didn't really feel like I had any business uh, acquaintances or partners or people that I could share this with without sort of feeling like uh, either ungrateful or like a failure. So it was tough. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, you know, when uh, we decide to make a change because everybody around us is very used to us the way we are. 
And if there's going to be this big change, then all of a sudden, like, I don't know who this person's going to be when they're no longer doing all of those things. And uh, I had an interesting situation in my family. My nephew was a very, very good uh, soccer player. And in Canada, that's incredibly unusual uh, to the point where he actually was the main goalkeeper for the first divisions, uh, first, the Scottish first divisions, 18 and 17 and 18 year old club and he was so good that normally the professional club has three goalkeepers and they only kept two because they knew that my nephew could jump in if he had to and and be the third goalkeeper at that level and so he did this for two years he was living in Dundee Scotland and after the third year he said to his dad I want to come home like I've seen this lifestyle I'm lonely I don't like it and of course I don't know what his dad said to him or his mom said to him or his grandma said to him, but his uncle said to him, are you nuts? <laughs> you know, you, years you're going to have a multi-million dollar contract, like play till you're 24, take, save your $5 million and you, oh, you're on easy street, right? Uh, who cares if you're unhappy? <laughs> and I didn't say that, but uh, so he ended up leaving and he became a paramedic. And so his uncle, in his uncle's great wisdom, said to him, you know, you really don't have the option anymore of complaining. Like if you have a couple kids and you're living in a small place and you're not happy because you don't have any money, life, when you decided to come home, be clear on what you've sacrificed and what you want. And uh, just to prove that I'm not the, the wise Yoda of our family, he is absolutely loving and thriving as a paramedic, <laughs> picking up people that have, you know, bodies in contorted positions or had heart attacks or are dead. Right. Uh, all the things that would just absolutely, totally freak me out. I would want to have nothing to do with. He's doing it on a daily basis and as happy as a pig in shit. There's no other way for us old farm boys to call it. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and that's, that's, I'm really so happy for him. And uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. You, you know, I, I had, I had someone years ago share with me this concept called Aikigai, which is roughly translated. It's a Japanese phrase and it means your reason for being right. Um, I K I G A I your reason for being. And, and, um, you know, this has become sort of a big piece of my of my mentoring and consulting program because what I found in my life is that when you can communicate with people that you've found that, whether it's uh, professionally in a business environment with clients or whether it's personally, um, you just become very centered and very calm and very attractive um, to, uh, you know, you become a voice of reason and a voice of bliss and someone that people look to for guidance. Because you're so clearly operating, Scott, in your comfort zone, in that sweet spot, right in the middle of this Aikigai, um, this reason for being, right? And the Japanese believe that uh, often this requires a very long search, searching process, right, to find what this sweet spot is. But essentially, it's when you're in the middle of um, this sort of flux between that which you are good at, that which you love to do that which you can get paid for, and that which the world needs. And so when you're operating in the very center of that spot, that, that sweet spot, the Aiki, when you found your Aikigai and you're doing work that you love, and you're doing work that you're good at, and you're doing work that people need, and you can also get paid for it, um, it's just an incredible thing. And, and that's part of the reason why I was so excited to connect with you because whether you know it or not, that feeling comes across in your communications. It comes across in your marketing. And even when you're just being yourself on, on Facebook or whatever, because it feels, it feels to me on that spot, you seem to be doing what you love. You seem to be doing something that the world needs. You seem to be doing something that you're really good at and, and you, and you're getting paid for it. It makes you happy. Right. Um, and, and uh, so I guess what I'm saying in a long sort of roundabout way is that for any of the business owners or entrepreneurs that are listening to this, you may want to examine those four pieces, right? And it seems like your nephew 
has found that spot, right? And if he's making the amount of money that he yep. needs to make to be happy, then then that's just incredible. That's wonderful. That's amazing. And 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 if you look at those four spots and something feels out of alignment in your life and you're not getting quite where you want to get, I'm going to guess that one of those pieces or more are out of alignment, right? And and I know that you've uh, worked with a lot of entrepreneurs who are in different verticals, different businesses, and I know a lot of extraordinarily talented uh, natural health practitioners and yogis and artists who are doing what they love and they're doing something that the world needs, but they're not quite figuring out how to get paid for it yet. And so that's where they need to focus their attention, right? Yeah, or you yeah. Come across, that's a great point. Across, yeah, you come across people in the world who are doing stuff that the world needs and stuff that they're good at but they're maybe a little unethical. So they're getting paid, right? But one of the pieces is not working out. Maybe they don't love it. They're just in it for the money, right? And it's always apparent when you come across that. Yeah, it really is. And, and I think you make some great points there, Eric. And it's also something that changes over time. What you may love doing today, like I hardly write any copy and I used to write a lot of copy a long sales copy and I don't know why it changed it just changed I moved on to doing other things and I think you need to be open to the growth that comes and just says you know what this was really good for me 10 years ago this was really good for me seven years ago this is really good for me four years ago and now I'm I'm doing something different today and it's all part of this growth and it's interesting because wrote uh the skills that i learned writing copy have been so valuable to me with the uh, with the Udemy courses that i put out or with the video courses that i put out and in particular when i'm working with or training with other instructors and i i recall a workshop that i was at and one of the one of the students said well you know my course is going to be on this like what should i call it and i just Poof! All this copy came just spewing out of my mouth, right? <laughs> and I didn't remember it, and nobody else listening remembered it. Just we all knew it was that was awesome. So from that then on, they put a recorder on. Every time I opened my mouth, they made sure we recorded it so <laughs> it wouldn't get lost. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think you bring up something really important, which is that you know change is inevitable, right? Um, and I know that you know. Just back to earlier in our conversation, when my first business started to change and the market started to change around me and it started to slowly make less money and I started to get more and more unhappy. So it was like, right? Um, I didn't want to admit it, man. I didn't want to admit it. Um, but sort of accepting, accepting the fact that change is inevitable and that you know, I, ch I ch actually chatted, Scott, with a guy named Marty Neumeyer, who's a really well-known brand strategist. And he said, you know, Eric, 20 years ago, I was designing software boxes. He's like, are you even old enough to know what those are? Do you remember when there were stores like CompUSA and every piece of software you bought came in a big box? He said, I designed all those. And then slowly over time, those stores all shut. And then slowly over time, all the software went online and became downloadable because the speed of the internet increased. And he said, if I hadn't have pivoted, we would have starved to death. And, um, you know, you look at some of the big disruptive companies right now, like Uber and Airbnb, and um, the companies that are getting left in the dust, you know, traditional taxi companies, um, you know, hotel chains, it's because they're not, they're not willing to pivot. They're not willing to admit that change is happening, right? And, um, and so, you know, this has given me as well, I know that this is maybe a little off topic, but this has given me a, a much broader and deeper gratitude for my relationship with my wife because we've been together for, you know, 19, almost 20 years now. And it, it's entirely possible and probably likely that most people who have been together that long, you change apart rather than together, right? And Wendy and I have somehow luckily changed together. Um, because we all change, we all change. And so I think that when I look at my relationship framed like that, I'm like, wow, this is remarkable. That really is. And congratulations, Eric. 
my marriage lasted 12 years and it ended over 20 years ago. So uh, my hat's off to you for, for uh, well, going it, together. That's amazing. I, I don't know if it felt bad in the moment when that happened, because I know at that point you had younger kids. And so I'm guessing maybe it was a little painful, right? But when you look at it, from the framework of understanding that we all change and sometimes people just change in different directions and that's totally natural. That doesn't mean that anyone failed. Right. And that's sort of what I had to learn to apply to my business. That's a really good point because it did feel very much to me like a failure, like it was the biggest failure of my life to be quite honest. And it was also an incredibly um, uncomfortable, vicious, mean divorce uh on the other person's part <laughs> you know and uh, it had to be uh, so it was not only was it a big failure it was an incredibly uh painful ugly painful ugly experience and the you know and so one one day i don't know a couple of years after the the divorce went through i was with my dad and, and you know how sometimes you're with people that you know they know you really really well and you you almost forget that they're you're just sort of talking out loud and they're listening that's what it kind of was i just sort of said man i just feel like such a failure and my dad looked at me and he said i have never been as proud of you as i have watching you go through the last two years and how you've handled yourself how you've handled your children and how you have stuck to uh, your values throughout this really difficult time and it just made the world of difference to me. And uh, then about five years later, my ex broke up with the person that she left me with. And uh, about a year after that breakup, she and I were talking and she said, you know, uh, I have a whole new appreciation for you that I didn't have when we broke up. And I'm really sorry that uh, it was, you know, as, as hard as it was. I, I didn't realize, you know, what I was, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. She, she kind of came to a realization that the way she was perceiving the situation wasn't in fact the way the situation was. And uh, so the whole thing kind of gelled into, you know, a dark night of the soul into a beautiful dawn, if I can put it that way. That's awesome, man. That's really powerful. Yeah. I mean, that, that sort of is what has happened with my business. Um, and sometimes it takes time and, and, it, it, and it always takes a willingness to create some space and step back and look at it from a different framework of that, the one that you're currently in, right? Absolutely. So Eric, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do for those that don't know, which is almost so, everybody uh, listening. Yeah, no problem. So we have a company called Stafford Marketing. We work with clients and primarily what we do is we work with clients to get clear on some of the stuff that we've been talking about. Um, we work through some value stuff. We work through some mindset stuff. Uh, we help our clients craft uh, signature systems, you know, if they want to create um, some sort of a product or course that they can sell either online or offline. And we, we really just work with people to help them tell their best and most powerful message in as clear and concise of a way as possible. And so that starts by really understanding uh, your IQ guy and why it's important to you and why it works for you. And then figuring out the pieces of that that you can communicate with your with your best potential audience so that you can go and kick a dent in the world. Beautiful. I love that. It sounds amazing. So when you're working with different entrepreneurs, are, is there any uh, sort of similar issues or problems that you see them or commonalities that you see them struggling with? Yeah, you know, I, I, I guess the first thing that immediately pops into my head, Scott, is the fact that um, as much as I love the internet and as much as it has made it much easier to get information and do research and uh, share your message, it's also created an, uh, just an overwhelming pile of advice on all sorts of different topics that are being given from people who maybe aren't qualified to give that advice. And so um, there's a lot of people out there who, um, you know, are own small businesses or are looking to grow um, their personal brand or, or whatever. And they've just heard so many different things that they feel that they need to be doing. Right. So, uh, man, I, I need to be, uh, doing Facebook ads, man. I need a funnel, man. I need click funnels, man. I need a blog, man. I need to be writing content. Maybe I need a, 
Amazon bestseller. Maybe I need to do this. You know, I, I need a Facebook account. And I think that that, that way of thinking is sort of flawed. I think that, I think that you should reverse engineer that and start at the beginning and figure out the sort of business that you want to build that will support you or the sort of style of marketing and communicating and the platforms that you communicate on that will support you and will support how you like to get your message out and what that looks and feels like, right? And so rather than rather than having someone tell you, oh man, SEO is the new hot shit, you have to be doing SEO. Well, if you don't like analytics and you're not good with numbers and you're not a good writer and you can't create content, you don't know anything about keyword research, then why the hell would you bother trying to do that, right? And conversely, if, if you're shy and not really good on camera, video marketing, no matter how great it is, it's probably just not for you, right? And so the very first thing we try and do is we try and, we try and look at our client's existing business and identify gaps where maybe they're creating marketing uh, because someone told them to, <laughs> and maybe is not in alignment with who they are and how they like to communicate. And those gaps for us are really easy to, to find just because we have a lot of experience, but also because that tends to be where effort and time and money is going into a black hole that no results are coming out of because it's out of alignment, right? I love that. And the whole idea of reverse engineering is something that I think uh, everybody should be paying way more attention to, right? It's kind of like, I know how my life was, right? <clears throat> I went to school, graduated high school. My dad says, well, you should go to university. So I went to university for four years, got a Bachelor of Commerce degree. Then I had worked for four years putting myself through university. And the company said, well, you have a Bachelor of Commerce degree and uh, you know the business. We're going to make you a manager. So congratulations. And 20 years later, uh, I had a whole bunch of experience in, a, in the food industry and left it because <laughs> It was not. Uh, it was not a pleasant uh, experience. And point did I ever think, what do I want? Like, wh you know, what do I want my life to look like? Oh, you know, you you buy a house, you get married, you have a couple kids, you retire. Like that's your life. There was never any questioning of what does Scott want. And of course, once I left that and became uh, an entrepreneur, working a solopreneur, working for myself. Uh, it all changed. It became a lot more about what do I want to have in my life? How do I want to live my life? What does it take to live the life that I want? Right now, I'm six months or eight months into a, a trip around the world. I'm in Ukraine in Odessa, as you can see behind me, and uh, a very minimalistic life. I have one suitcase and I have one backpack. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the story you shared about your nephew is a perfect example of that, right? Like you, you had used the specific phrase, the opportunity of a lifetime, but whose lifetime, right? The opportunity of his lifetime was not that opportunity. We're going to wrap it up, Eric, but I have one last question, and that is, what advice would you give uh, entrepreneurs that are just starting? Um, you know, I, I would give, um, I would give the advice, uh, along the lines of what you and I were just talking about. I think it's probably the most powerful thing I could share, which is to really take a hard look at, you know, who you are as a person and the, what you feel you have to contribute and share with this world and what that looks like, right? Before you consider logos and before you consider colors or domain names or platforms, you know, YouTube this or Facebook that. Uh, really take a long minute and think about what you feel most powerfully driven to share and how that might look for you. And there's lots of different paths that you can take to share anything. Um, you can speak, you know, in front of local groups. You can, um, in, you know, you can write Amazon bestsellers. You can create a YouTube channel. You can build a Facebook following. There's, there's literally, uh, you can speak from stage. There's, there's hundreds of different paths that you could take and different platforms that you could use. And I would just encourage you to find something that resonates with you and how you're wired as a person so that you don't end up, you know, a cat person that owns a business selling dog toys. Analogy, I love that. Yeah, cat person selling dog toys. I think that's the way most people end up. So, Eric, before we go, thank you very much for sharing uh, your time and your knowledge with uh, myself and our audience. I really appreciate it. Before we go, if somebody wanted to contact you or connect with you, how can they do that? The best way to do that is by um, 
looking me up on Facebook. My name is Eric D. Stafford or visiting staffordmarketing.com. And this has been Internet Marketing Unleashed with your host, Scott Patton, the Dean of Blogonomics and Podology. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.